So here is the, the scenario, right? This is kind of like an exercise for you to try. So assume there is forecast bias, obviously, right? And the financial forecast is committed by sales and marketing or division general manager to the president of the company who submits it to the Wall Street, right? But let's assume the CEO is a good guy, right? But the, the president of the company who submits it to the CEO, or the general manager of the company who submits to the CEO, he is actually has been disciplined and trained and taught that, you know, he should not miss a forecast under any circumstances, right? I mean, that's what he was told, right? Because pe previously we have missed forecasts, we have gone to Wall Street, and they have pummeled our stock, right? So let's say case one, forecaster with high variance, right? Meaning volatility, right? Very high volatility. So next period you estimate the sales going to be $100 million, okay? Total financial forecast for the division. This is what your demand from the estimates to be $100 million. Best case scenario, so all ducks in a row, then everything happens, it's all booming, lofty, positive. Best case, you could sell as much as $200 million worth of product. Right? That's the best case scenario. So the demand planner is very confident that this, scenario is, 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 this, this type of a chart is a rea reality, it's realistic. So average is $100 million. best case is $200 million. But things could turn out to be bad, right? Economy could sour, right? And then the, the, your demand for estimates that worst case, we could only sell, end up selling $50 million, right, $50 million. So the question for you is, what do you think is the general manager's financial forecast to the president of the company, given the scenario? The general manager is going to tell the supply chain a number about $100 million to make. Yeah. And then tell the president a number below $100 million. Yes. Okay, good, very good, excellent. That's, that's a very good point, yeah. So, good, that's, uh, that's what I was looking for. But, you know, if you think about it in, in an extreme case, right, if the general manager doesn't want to miss any orders from the customers, best case scenario, $200 million, right, then they would tell the supply chain to make $200 million worth of product because they wouldn't miss anything, right? If they, miss two, if they make $200 million worth of product, then they can meet all of the customers' orders. Right? I mean, of course, theoretical situation, scenario, right? So, um, you know, because if the supply chain, let's say the supply chain makes only 150. Let me just change in colors here. So supply chain, let's say supply chain makes only 150. Okay? So what will happen? Um, and the orders actually come in at 175. Right? So customers order $175 million worth of product. So what will happen? Actually, there's a service issue, right? Because supply chain could only supply 150 and you couldn't supply $25 million worth of product. So that could be a service issue almost close to 9, 10%, right? You know, actually it's more than that. It's almost 18, 19%, right? So almost 20% you couldn't supply. So customer service became a big issue because supply chain was only making 150 and the orders came in at 175. So he faces that uncertainty. So he faces the real manager faces that uncertainty of what's going to happen, right? And that's where the game playing is going to happen. Now... And the next thing that happens is the CEO claims a victory because they had 50% more sales than the average. Even though, right, even, right, though right. even though customers are not happy because they haven't filled orders. Yeah, right, exactly. That is true. Now, on the other hand, let's not, you know, let's, let's th just still think about what the general manager's behavior would be, right? So the general manager is basically, you know, the president, when the president is asking for a forecast, right, of course, it's an ex another extreme situation. The president has told him repetitively, repeatedly, right? Do not give me a forecast that you think you would meet, you would miss under any any situation, right? So under any situation, if you think you will miss a forecast, do not give that to me as a forecast. Any forecast you give it to me, you have to be able to beat, meet or beat that forecast, right? I'm not sure if it is a good lesson or not because I know that there is a lot of chaos that could happen with such type of pronouncements, right? So he's, you know, so basically... The general manager will give him a forecast, financial forecast, of only $50 million, 
not a penny more, right? Even the supply chain case is okay, right? You can actually pacify the customers. But the financial case, right, the, the president has told them very clearly, do not tell me a forecast that you cannot meet, right? Because let's assume that the supply chain manager, you know, the general manager communicates a forecast of $100 million. So what will happen? If it is a forecast of $100 million, there is exactly a 50% chance that the actual demand will come below the $100 million or a 50% chance the actual demand will come above the $100 million. That's a pretty huge chance that he's taking, right? So if he, you know, on the other hand, if he communicates, say, you know, let's say he communicates $70 million as the, for, as the forecast, right? There is still a chance that the actual demand will come in below 70. So if he communicates $50 million as his forecast, then there is a zero chance that the actual demand will come below because 50 is the lowest possible on the curve, right? Anything that comes in will be above that. So he can tell the president very proudly, you know, I gave you a forecast, sir, that I will never miss. Any number that comes in will always be higher than $50 million, right? The CEO is very happy. I mean, this is kind of an extreme situation to make you think. But in reality, is not really that different. You know, maybe the curve may be a little bit different, but the reality is not different because people are always trying to hedge their bets, right? So let's look at the uh, let's look at the other situation here. Let me just put you on mute here. Just one second. Okay. So let's look at this other situation here. In this particular situation, what's happening is you have a demand curve. I mean, you know, you have a demand curve that looks really kind of a very compact demand curve, right? Average is 100. Worst case scenario is 98. Best case scenario is 102, right? So the general manager, he still, still adopts the same behavior because the CEO has told him, don't tell me a forecast that you will miss, right? So the general manager communicates a forecast of $98 million to this, the, the CEO or the president. And the general manager or the sales manager tells the supply chain guys that he is expecting $102 million. Supply chain knows that he has only said 98 to the financial commitment, right? But supply chain doesn't care about it. Supply chain said that's fine, right? We can make 102 because it's within plus or minus 2% of the truth, right? So we are okay with it. Right? Even plus or minus 5%, we are okay with it because we are going to make safety stock anyway. Right? So if you're going to do 102, we can definitely supply it. Right? We can just like do it. It's a breeze. We can do it. So here, the general manager doesn't really have much of an incentive to play even games here. Right? General manager may actually say, you know, it's okay, $100 million. You know, even if the financial, the financial culture is, is good, the, the president may say, you know, it's okay for you to miss your forecast by plus or minus 1%, plus or minus 2%, but I want you to come in pretty close to what you say, right? But regardless, even if it, it, that's not the case, they are not going to do much. They are not going to miss much. The financial commitment 98 works well for the president because they will beat the forecast in all uh, possibilities, right, in all situations. And then the supply chain is not worried because they are only making a little bit more, which they will be making anyway. Right? So really, at the end of the day, what's happening is when your volatility is, is huge, demand volatility is huge and it's unpredictable, then there is more game playing that takes place. Right? When the volatility is not as huge, right? when the volatility is you know, it's, it's very compact, then the job is made easy in terms of what commitments are made. Okay, what commitments are made. So in this case, you know, and, and that's the reason why companies actually opt for now what is called as a tolerance, forecast tolerance or a forecast threshold. So basically they say, hey, you know, if it is within plus or minus 5% between supply chain and finance, that's okay, we'll move on. Because we know the realities of the world, right? Supply chain, by definition, has to make more than what the average demand is to cover margin of error. That's for sure. Secondly, from a financial perspective, Wall Street always expects you to beat the number, right? Even if it is a penny, if you beat it or just meet it, you are okay. If you beat it by a penny, you are rewarded by Wall Street, right? You get your stocks go up, stock price goes up. If you miss it by a penny, you get crushed, right? But if you, miss, if you beat your EPS by, say, 50%, then Wall Street punishes you too because they, he, Wall Street tells you that, you know, you guys cannot forecast. That's a big problem. 
right? Because you, your actuals cannot be that much off, right? Obviously, you're doing something wrong because, you know, that also means there is pent-up demand that you are not really planning for, right? So it's almost like the Nintendo case, right? Nintendo had this this awesome product that was like a blowout success, right? You know, that has never, you know, people had never seen anything like it in terms of either supply chain or in terms of going to market. The Nintendo Wii that was launched a few years ago. Nintendo was out of stock on the Wii for almost four years after launch, right? Uh, you know, Nintendo obviously puts a good face on it, but you know, the, the problem is Nintendo did well financially and all that, but they could have done a lot more because some of the profits that Nintendo should have made were made by people who were selling bootleg product, you know. Uh, people end up buying Nintendo at, uh, at, the, at the black market, right? In Amazon.com, it was selling for 350 where Nintendo was selling it for 250 So all of these things happen, right, because there is a variety of things happen if you cannot forecast, and Wall Street knows that, right? So, um, you know, iPod, iPod was such a situation, iPhone was such a situation, but Apple as a company was very well run. They corrected very quickly. Within six months, they recovered, with, with both with the iPod shortage and iPhone shortage. But Nintendo didn't recover for a long, 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 long time, right? So, so basically, I mean, I think if you are perennially under forecasting or if you are under forecasting by a huge margin, then there are probably other issues within the company that, or danger signals, you know, for the company as such. I think, you know, another classic case was Agilent Technologies at one point in time, where they had a huge forecast error on the lower side. And eventually the company suffered a lot in the in the following two years or so um, after this happened. So anyway, I mean, you know, regardless, the reality is under forecasting the financial commitment to a certain extent is okay because all signals point to beating the financial forecast, right? But over forecasting the supply chain within a threshold is also okay because by definition you are going to carry inventories and a margin of error, right? But when you have a huge, widely varying demand profile, that's where the problem is. There are more biases. So as demand planners, right, one is to come up with an accurate forecast, which doesn't mean you have to come, you know, that doesn't mean your job is to hit the, the average or the mean. Right? Your job is really to see how you can compact this, this profile, and convert this to this profile, right? so that the forecast could be more accurate. Because when you are communicating the supply chain, you are supply, you're communicating an expected degree of error right? in the future. Right? So really, your job is to say, you know, I have this, but I'm going to go here. Right? So that which means my forecasts are within a very compact distribution, right? within a very compact uh, distribution. 